and welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe so you won't miss a new episode. I'm your host, Fritz Bussemaker, and today I'm delighted and privileged to have a conversation with Anil Seth. Anil, welcome to the program. Fritz, thanks for having me. Allow me to introduce you to our audience. Uh, in short, you are a professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex, and you pioneered uh, research in the brain basis of consciousness for over 20 years. Uh, you are the author of the best-selling book, uh, Being You, which is the Times bestseller uh, uh, of 2021 and book of the year for The Economist. Now, uh, you did a TED Talk on this topic in uh, 2017, generating over 30 million uh, times uh, uh, views, so that's quite a lot. And you participated in a couple of films, documentaries about the topic, like The Most Unknown, The Search. Um, the list goes on, but we're going to cover this in our uh, discussion. Uh, written over 200 academic papers um, and being a highly cited researcher, and finally, we'll also talk about your role as the lead scientist in the groundbreaking Dream Machine project. Again, Anil, so much to talk about. Thank you so much. Now, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, my very first question is, given 30 million views on TED, um, I've also seen you doing over 25 podcasts. Uh, why do you think there's such a fascination to this topic? On this topic on neuroscience it's because it's i think simultaneously it's one of the deepest mysteries that still remain in science and philosophy and people have wondered about consciousness since they've wondered about anything and we still don't really understand despite the progress that has been made so it's a big mystery on the one hand and it's on the other hand it's a very personal mystery now it's not like how how does quantum mechanics work or what happened at the big bang it's Consciousness is what makes life for each of us worth living. It's the most important thing. We all, I think, want to understand ourselves better. Mm -hmm. And and if you if you pull on that thread far enough, then this is where you end up. You know, who are we? Well, we are who we are is shaped by or dependent on our brains, our bodies. How does that actually happen? And then if you ask who we are, you start to ask some other questions like. You know, where was I before I was born? What will happen after I, I'm dead? Do I have free will? And fundamentally, you just end up at the place where if I open my eyes in the morning and I have an experience of the world around me, how does that happen? So once you start thinking about, and we all think about it, once you, once you just keep on thinking about it, this is where you end up. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, I understand. Um... Makes sense. Um, now, you mentioned we don't understand consciousness. Uh, what Do we know what we don't understand? I think people disagree about that a little bit. And, and that's one of the things that makes it fascinating. There's, in many areas of science, there's a very kind of broad consensus about what the right questions are and what the methods are. It's just a case of getting there. With consciousness, it's different. This is why it's still at the intersection of science and philosophy. Because the questions change along with our increase in, in knowledge. Yeah. So for some people, you know, we think of the brain as a, as a computer of some sort and figuring out how consciousness happens is a question of figuring out what software, the hardware of the computer is running. But for other people like me, I don't think of it that way. You know, I think we're fundamentally living organisms and that consciousness is a biological property. We, we're wetware rather than hardware and our minds are mindware rather than software and if you think of it that way the, the questions change too so there's still some uncertainty about what it would even take to come up with a satisfactory understanding of how the the electrical pate inside our heads you know this this squishy stuff that we call our brains how that generates any kind of experience i mean that it's what it's what gets me up in the morning i mean it's still a mystery, but it's a mystery that we can actually make progress on every day. It sounds like um, it, it, is consciousness a question or, or, or a, a topic which actually fits into a science box? Because you just because what you're describing is your belief statement is determines what, how you define it, and then how you're going to research it and what it is. 
That's right, but that's not that unusual. In okay. science, definitions of topics often change as understanding progresses. I mean, you have in biology, you have something like the gene. Yeah. And the definition of what a gene is in biology was, was not set at the beginning. And then scientists just got on with the job of you know, unpacking DNA and, and, and listing the different genes. No, the definition of what a gene is changed from something that, you know, something broadly heritable from generation to generation until now we've got a very detailed understanding. And that no doubt will, will keep changing. And the same is true with consciousness. The important thing is the definitions we start with you know, make sense. And they don't have to be the final word. They won't be the final word. But if we we can just get on the same page and consciousness is what we lose when we, for instance, go under general anesthesia and it's what comes back when we come round again. You know, it's what makes us more than just complex biological objects. It's what gives us an inner life. And I think everybody can agree or most people can agree on that level of definition. And then it's this, this iterative process. Um, so, but you're right. It doesn't f purely fit into the science box. It's a, it's a mix of science and philosophy, and you know, also sociology and anthropology to some extent too. Okay. Now we just established the status quo, which you are an established scientist in this field. Uh, but I was just wondering how you got there. D did you plan this uh, when you started university to get here? So were you consciously planning to get here, or was it something which happened to you it's something it feels like it's happened to me but i certainly looking back i think it's, it's not entirely by accident right okay. and it's it's one of those strange things i mean the, the philosopher kierkegaard said life has to be lived forwards but can only be understood backwards um i was always fascinated by this question about consciousness and when i was an undergraduate in the early 1990s mm -hmm. consciousness was not on the menu it was considered in the in the domain of philosophy. It was considered rather disreputable part mm -hmm. of science because it's it is hard to study. Like I cannot put a conscious experience on the table and look at it. You know, I have to rely on indirect reports about what people say about what they experience. So it was really you know, it was out there, and I was advised many times not to focus on consciousness. There wasn't a lot of work out there. But it's such a central question. And indeed, at the beginning of psychology and neuroscience, it really was the central question. And I was lucky that the tide was beginning to turn in the 1990s, where new generations of researchers were coming along, and some very influential people in the field were trying to reassert the importance of studying consciousness. But I didn't get there by any strategic plan. I, mean, I, I finished my undergrad and I then thought, actually, maybe you know, I'll need a proper job rather than staying yeah. in academia. And I did a master's in computer science, yeah. partly because I thought this is going to be very useful for understanding the brain. But yeah. also it was a bit of a backup plan. I have to admit, it was like, well, if I, if I do that, then I've got some skills and that will help. And my PhD was also in computer science and AI. It was only after my PhD that I was able to... Um, refocus a bit more on consciousness but even that was rather serendipitous because my postdoc job after my phd I went to san diego and i was officially employed to help build robots you know, using my ai background but the real reason i went there was because the the main boss was a guy called gerald edelman who'd won a nobel prize and he was one of these key figures rehabilitating consciousness so I was able through that method to, to get back into the environment where consciousness was not only on the menu, it was, it was the main course. And from then on, things just continued. Okay. Uh, it sounds quite surprising. I hope I understood you correctly, but that your uh, mathematical and AI background almost run independently in parallel with the consciousness. And only in hindsight, they started to link again. Uh, it's not... That's not totally the case. I've always thought that in trying to understand anything about the brain, yeah. mathematical, computational, machine learning tools are really critical. I mean, we see this in AI now. I mean, our most powerful machine learning systems are based on neural networks. Mm -hmm. And neural networks are, are inspired to some extent by, by neurobiology. And, and, and we can interpret this link in, in different ways. But there was always this, this um, bi-directional relationship 
And in fact, the philosophy in the AI also interacts because you know, a lot of people think of AI or initially, certainly in the, in the 80s, 90s, the action in AI was in things like chess playing programs and, and things that didn't have bodies, didn't interact with their environment. But if we understand through robotics, the importance of embodiment and embeddedness in an environment, that can help us understand um, neuroscience in different ways too. We understand that the brain is not just a computer in a meat each robot that goes from one place to another and the brain is embodied and, and the body is, is embedded. And this has been, I think this has been one of the things that um, I've really benefited from throughout my career, which is combining multiple disciplines together because the big questions in nature and probably, you know, the big questions in you know, outside of academia as well, they don't, they never fit into single boxes. Yeah. The interesting action is always at the interfaces yeah, you know, that, and disciplines, you know, they're, they're inventions of administrators. They're, nature isn't carved at the joints of the disciplines that, that we have. And I think you need a willingness to reach out across disciplines, um, combine different methods, different approaches. And that's often necessary for progress. It's, it's usually the fastest way, progress at any rate. Okay, so uh, I'm hearing, and uh, would you say that's an advice or not? Realizing that if you combine diff, uh, classic different uh, uh, areas, uh, that innovation is where they uh, intersect. So bring them together and see what happens. I think that's definitely one way to to promote innovation. I mean, one example I think in 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 my work is like I got interested very about 20 years ago in causality like what causes what it's a very deep question as well and then there are all these kinds of mathematical methods for understanding measuring causality in systems and i just got interested in that as a general question and made some progress on that but then that turns out to be a, an incredibly powerful tool for conceptualizing how brains work for bridging between measures of brain dynamics and what brains do at the, at the functional level and how do they work, how they do stuff and ultimately how conscious experiences happen. Um, but that you know, involved putting together methods from statistics and, and in fact, from econometrics. So this sort of deeply mathematical branch of economics, putting together stuff from there with stuff from psychology and, and neuroscience. And you know, it wasn't that we had to get to the frontiers of each of each field. And I was taking fairly basic stuff from, from one area and putting it together with fairly basic stuff from another. But the rewards were, were very rich for doing that. I can, so leads me to a question which I was also, also, uh, always find fascinating, how we're moving from this, I say, this command and control to a connect and collaborate society. So we're moving from mm -hmm. our silos to one where we realize we're all part of a network and we need to somehow interact. Uh, but what you're describing is how do you get all these experts together and how do you make them realize, hey, we have actually fields which uh, could help each other. So yeah. who's the person in the middle? <laughs> that's tricky. I mean, increasingly, I've, I've begun to feel that that's what I can contribute in my limited way to, to what I do, you know. It's it's long past the point where I can I can delve into any single of these approaches and push 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 forward. Like in terms of the mathematics, I can't generate that anymore. I have to have work with mathematicians. In terms of any specific thing, I have to work with the people who are the experts on that specific thing. And then you're right; it, it requires somebody or some process by which you can facilitate communication across these things. And how does how do you do that that's that's why i think i've put increasing emphasis over over the last 10 years or so on um engagement on trying to boil things down to a simple story to make things accessible to bring out key points i mean this is why one reason i wrote the book one reason i did the ted talk one reason i do a lot of these you know these these more publicly accessible projects because you know i think this is necessary not it's not purely translating stuff from within universities or academia to the wider public it's it's facilitating communication within academia itself between different disciplines in my own lab we have these weekly lab meetings and people present and sometimes you know it'll be somebody presenting some really detailed stuff that's totally outside the background of some other people but i like to think this is still a good idea for everyone to you know dedicate an hour a week to sit through these things because it just 
it, it sort of seeps in anyway. You know, just yeah. this appreciation that's, that, oh, this is what these people are doing. And you know, that's the kind of thing that they do. And it may be, uh, in, and maybe an immediate realization, or it may be a week later, it may be a year later. There'll be this like, oh, maybe, maybe you can help me with this. Maybe no, there's something sense. we can do together here. And I, 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 I very much like that. Now, um, m- moving on, we met years ago at an AI summit, <clears throat> and you were one of keynote speakers there. Um, first of all, do you have an idea why you were invited? Uh, were you invited to show people the future of AI? Were you uh, there to put people at ease? Were Were you there to maybe to give a warning? Um, I mean, you have to ask the person who invited me for the, for the actual that. answer. But, okay, but, but, but maybe a, what did you talk about? Hey, what was the message yeah. you gave to the AI audience where you came from? I mean, so I I enjoyed being there because I have kind of inhabited this interface between AI and, and neuroscience and consciousness for, for a long time. And I really wanted to, to communicate that there's a lot that the field of AI has to contribute to, but potentially has to learn from you know, when it comes to those of us working in the neuroscience of consciousness. Um, you know, there's some sort of long-standing, quite quite tricky to dislodge assumptions that people have about the relationship between AI and consciousness. You know, the idea that maybe <laughs> as AI gets smarter, it will suddenly become conscious. I mean, we've already seen things like this. You know, after we met, I think it was last year, the Google engineer who thought that the language model Lambda was, was sentient. Now, it, it, it just, it, it isn't. And it's one thing that the whole AI community basically united on, which is very rare, was that it's not conscious and that this guy, Blake Lemon was, was talking nonsense. But there are fascinating questions there. And I, I think having an opinion from the philosophy of neuroscience of consciousness is useful because we can ask questions about what it would take for a machine to be conscious. Should we do it? I think the answer to that is no. I think we should not be trying to build conscious machines. Um, and how would we even know? So there's lots of lots of interfaces there. Fundamentally, though, there was another reason that I was there, I think, which is just by explaining a little bit about how not just this big mystery of consciousness as this big philosophical mystery, but in practice, how does the brain construct perceptual experience of the world? How, what is the nature of the self? Questions like this are things that, you know, it's, we do understand quite a lot about now. And there are some quite counterintuitive answers there that, you know, that we don't just passively register objective reality through our senses. We actively construct it. At every moment, our brains create our worlds. They don't just just absorb our worlds. And understanding things like that, there are lots of parallels at the the you know, at the deep level with algorithms and artificial intelligence. But it's also just something that that we can take away and apply to our own fields. Okay, so just like in whichever you- way we want. So, uh, and maybe this is also advice for people out there who want to start to learn something. It's, as you said, in your own lab, you bring people together and let them talk about it. Uh, it, it this is an, another, yet another example. Okay, um, we get somebody in to talk about something which is related to our AI topic, uh, but then that might lead to some serendipitous ideas, some inspiration, uh, maybe on the day itself, maybe a couple of years later, because people realize, hey, you talk, you discuss something, you you shared something with us, which we're going to use in our research. That's right. Or, or maybe even outside of research. And, you know, so for instance, one of the, one of the core ideas I, I usually talk about and that, that I've written about too at length is um, the idea of perception as a controlled hallucination. Yeah. And you know, this is this, it follows on from what we were just talking about that contrary to the everyday assumption that we sort of our brains read out the world using sensory information no the brain is constantly making predictions about the way the world is and the way the body is and using sensory information to calibrate these predictions what we experience is the predictions now this is my hypothesis anyway and this is what we test in the lab what what we experience is the predictions, are the predictions, 
and the sensory information is never actually experienced. It just keeps the predictions tuned to the world. And this has a lot of consequences. I mean, it really flips how we think you know, or, or what you, what we call the folk psychology, the everyday idea of perception is the world is just out there with all its properties and we just transparently receive them into our minds. No, we, we experience the world from the top down, from the inside out, not from the outside in. This is, you know, firstly, it's just like, yeah, that doesn't fit with ha how it feels like when I walk down the road, but it is. And then it has a lot of implications. Like we all will experience the world slightly differently is one implication, which is something we're, we're measuring at the moment in a new project. And there are other implications that um, how things seem is not necessarily how things are. So perception plays all kinds of tricks on us. If things change slowly, we don't experience the change. And that, for instance, is, a me is something that I think could be very useful in business because people often want to know about you know, how to implement, manage change. And of course, how we perceive change is, is an important part of that. And knowing how that happens can give people a, more insight into what's going on in their own context and also more levers that they can use to implement things. Okay. That, uh, I know that sounds like a, quite a nice segue to a project you're involved in where you're the lead scientist, as mentioned, the, the, the Dream Machine project. Um, yes, yeah, so this is another example of of exactly what can happen when you bring people from very different disciplines together. And for me, this was a, a real challenge because it wasn't only a collaboration in science and philosophy. Okay, the Dream you Machine explain project. Explain the audience what is what the, the project is. Uh, yeah. So the yeah. sorry, I, I, yeah. I was, so the Dream Machine project. Um, it has its origins both in, in art with an artist called Brian Geisen in the 1950s and in science with a neuroscientist called William Gray Walter, also in the 1950s. The basic phenomenon discovered by both of them was that if you, if you have someone close their eyes and expose them to very bright flickering light, stroboscopic light at the right frequencies, and you do it very carefully, then pretty much everyone will have very vivid visual hallucinations vivid colors shapes patterns perhaps even more vivid than normal perception which is something that i find remarkable you know, colors that they've never seen before colors that have a depth and a strength and their eyes are closed and it's just white light so this is this is the basic phenomenon and um it's an altered state of consciousness if you like but a very controllable one and a state that doesn't require any drugs or anything like that and people find it quite transformational. So I'd been working on this in the lab for about 10 years as a side project. Um, but then I got involved. I didn't set, I didn't start the this 20 foot, this dream machine project, but I got involved as a lead scientist with the aim of bringing the this experience to tens of thousands of people. So we got funding from the UK government and we it was a group of of scientists like me, philosophers engineers, um, musicians. We had John Hopkins, a famous musician in the UK and architects and, uh, and designers. Um, and we built dream machines that could, um, that, that had stroboscopic lights and, and sort of embedded loudspeakers. But the idea was we'd made it a collective experience. So we built these installations that could house 20 or 30 people at a time who would go through a, a stroboscopic hallucination experience but we couched the whole thing in a very carefully designed audience journey so so there was we, we redeveloped whole buildings we we made sure that this this experience was sort of ignited curiosity in people about how the brain and the mind works and we accompanied it with all kinds of other things like a big education program a big research program and so on and the, the thing that really, and we had 40,000 people do this last year, which is kind of extraordinary to me because it's it, it's hard to get this kind of thing done. And so to reach 40,000 people across the UK in a, in a few months um, was beyond you know, my dreams for the project, but it, but it worked and people absolutely loved it. It was completely booked out the, the whole time. And what really sat with me was that often when science and art meet, it's usually the science is inspiring the art or the science is interpreting some data from the art, something like that. 
interaction, but they remain somehow separate. And the interaction is often a bit superficial. Here, everybody, it was the science, the art, the philosophy, the engineering were all completely necessary. And what came out was the result of a very deep collaboration built in from the very beginning. And, and that was new to me. We couldn't have done it you know, through any single approach. It had to be a, a collective. Now, on one hand, this sounds like art for art's sake to just to have people experience something they can enjoy or have you also uh, has it also been used to maybe learn something from have you have you taken something back to your field yeah that that's a good question i mean firstly there's nothing wrong with art for art for art's sake of course i think it's 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 of inherent value to give people potentially transformational experiences so they they think about their own lives and their worlds in different ways and, and certainly that that has happened and we had to also be very careful. We didn't want it to feel like an experiment that people did, you know, to make people feel like guinea pigs in a in a big, big study. Um, but we were very open about what we were doing too. The answer was yes, we, we are taking stuff back. So one of the really interesting things we found was that even though it's exactly the same situation that everybody goes into, the same light, the same kind of environment, everybody has a different experience. And so we want to understand why this is so, you know, why do pe people have such dramatically different experiences there? A lot of people just see colors and shapes. Other people have whole narratives unfolding, you know, experiences of people and places and, and so on. Why, why is that? So we, we now have the data that can allow us to understand at least the nature of this, this variation. Then we, we noticed a lot of people were actually feeling mentally a lot better after this kind of experience and there's some parallels between the dream machine and psychedelics of course both take you into a state where you experience very vivid perception perceptions which you normally don't and so we're now looking into developing this in the lab as uh, a complementary therapy for for depression which i think will be very exciting um and accompanying this, we have this other project, and this other project is still going on. So we wanted to really drill down into this idea that people have different experiences for the same environment. And of course, this is something that's not limited to weird situations like the dream machine. This is happening everywhere and all the time. We all differ on the outside in skin color and height and body shape. And we're used to that. And we value that these days. But we all have different brains, so we're all going to differ on the inside too. And well, the way you describe it, uh, I mean, I have to just share this with you. It, uh, could this be the reason, or uh, or could this be a clue why some people believe and other people do not believe? Because if those people, I, I'm making an association here, but if you say okay, there are people in exactly the same experiment who one just experiences colors, the others uh, experience a complete story being told. I can imagine that you're more perceptive of uh, something religious behind that. Uh, why am I seeing, experiencing this? I mean, it could be, it could be that there are, I think we really underestimate the impact of the differences in how our minds work on things like what we might believe and, mm -hmm. and how we might go about our lives and, and, and you know, what we might okay. be able to do. Because we we can't see it, we can't see how people are on the inside. We can only we can only tell by what they say, and we're very we're actually quite bad at describing the nature of our our experiences. Okay. So one of the conclusions, if I hear that, is um, although we still we all have that same uh, pink gray uh, gray matter, um, how it's being used has a significant difference from person to person, and that is something we should be aware of. I think so. And that's something, I mean, it's not a new idea, right? I mean, people have known this for a long time. We talk about neurodiversity for a long time already, but typically neurodiversity is associated with conditions like autism or ADHD. My point here is that don't have to think about these, about different conditions. We're all different. And in this middle range, the differences might not be so great. In fact, we might not notice them because we'll still use the same words like, oh, I see a red car or, or the sky is blue but we still might be having different experiences. And so there's, we have this project, it was part of Dream Machine actually, it's called the Perception Census. And it's still running, it's an online citizen science experiment 
um, just a series of, of fun and engaging little illusions and interactive experiments that anyone can do. So if anyone is, is watching or listening to this and, and wants to contribute <laughs> to this advance of knowledge, but also learn a bit more about perception and their own way of perceiving the world, we'd love people to take part. Um, it's just have to look for the perception census online or on my website and, and you can you can find it. And it doesn't take long and you can do bits of it, come back and, and people are finding it fun. We've had about 27,000 people take part from 100 countries so far. And my vision for this is that it's going to provide a one of a kind map, an atlas, if you like, of this these differences that we just have very little idea about and it's and the key about the census is we're not looking only at let's say how we differ in our experience of color i want to know how we differ in our experience of time of sound of in music and emotion so we can begin to see are there such things as perceptual personalities can we understand people through this dimension this inner dimension um as well as the other ways that we try to understand the differences between between people and i think Back to your point, even without the data, just recognizing the possibility of this and you know, recognizing that indeed we each see the world in our own unique way. I think that by itself is very helpful because it cultivates a little bit of humility you know, about yeah. our own way of seeing things. And that can be a basis for empathy, for communication, for understanding with others. Exactly the word I was thinking of, uh, empathy, it uh, makes sense. Hey, uh, last couple of questions, and you know, time is moving so fast. That's my perception of this interview, that we're running out of time. Uh, hey, where do you draw your inspiration from? What are, uh, is that people, ideas, observations? I think it's a combination of other people. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the joys of, of my my career has been the opportunity to be around extraordinary inspirational people and you know both people I've learned from who have sort of been in the, the business longer than me but increasingly the students that I work with the young people coming through who bring energy ideas motivation new approaches and you know one of the things I love the most is just going back into the lab and having the chance to talk to to the people there and I don't do it nearly as much as I should that for me is, is the main source of inspiration. The other source of inspiration is just is just nature. I mean, it, nature just keeps on giving. It's it's the more you look, the more there's there to find, the more wonderful that is. Again, you alluded to an advice to young the young uh, audience out there. Um I might are you suggestion that uh, if if you are young and you're just starting off your career, it doesn't matter what it is um speak out because you should realize also people will be listening to what you have to contribute yeah i think it's finding the balance isn't it i think you know when you're starting out of course you should also listen i mean there's a lot to learn um and keep focused on on the questions so this gets us back to where we started about disciplines and and and, and mixing disciplines and i think if you if you keep focused on on your objectives and your questions and and figure out what you need to answer those rather than just thinking should I do X or Y and and you know, don't yeah think of it that way um, then I think you're more likely to to find a fulfilling uh, career um, but also yeah I mean your opinion opinions matter opinions are useful at, at any stage and I learn a lot all the time just by you know, from the people who are ostensibly working for me. I mean, they, they're they the experts on what they do. And my main benefit is in is in taking what they say seriously, listening to them. Okay, so that in itself is also an advice not only to the young people, but also to the old people out there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, hopefully the, the, the listeners will uh, take that advice to heart. Uh, I know I will. Uh, this has been a discussion on consciousness. It's a also a discussion for me about maybe understanding where empathy comes from and um but also i'm uh, so pleased that you're willing to take time with us to make us conscious of the fact that the conscious is a very is a topic about us it's about understanding who we are so anil thank you so much for being here Fritz, thanks it's been a delight thank you very much 
Thank you for listening to the brand called You Video Cast and Podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.